we're in the crux of this incredible inflection point where corporatization and technology and telemedicine as a piece of that are kind of on this like exponential rise within the industry. And, and that inflection is an opportunity for us to decide how are we going to implement these tools? How are we going to implement these structures? And what is that going to look like for A, pets, but then B, like the people that are providing care? Welcome to Vet Life Reimagined. I love it when I get recommendations for guests for the podcast. And this guest is a recommendation from Dr. Sonia Olson, who was a past guest on the podcast. And I'm so glad she connected us. Veterinary medicine is a second career for Sam, but he has worked with animals for a long time. I'll let him talk more about his career journey in the discussion, but Sam is a natural leader who advocates for colleagues and embraces opportunities to get involved in impacting the future of the profession. He embodies a refreshing zest for vet med and desires to help the next generation grow professionally. His wide range of interests and fearless leadership makes me excited to have colleagues like him joining us. This is a fun and inspiring conversation. On to Sam Schopler. You have a really unique career journey. You are not an early identifier. So do you mind sharing your journey to getting to vet school where you are now? Yeah, I can start all the way at the beginning which is that my dad is a veterinarian. My aunt is a veterinarian. So I did kind of grow up around veterinary medicine and my mom is a nurse and lactation consultant. So dinner topics, there was nothing was off limits. Iron stomach day one. But growing up, I just kind of, I guess, rebelliously was like, I'm never going to be a vet. So I never imagined going to vet school. I never imagined being a doctor or anything. I played basketball and really enjoyed sports and didn't really think about academics at all. I actually went to a really small Quaker school in North Carolina called the Carolina Friends School. So we didn't get grades. We were just kind of like everything was a written evaluation. And so needless to say, I didn't learn how to study very well because I just basically got away with like coming to class and asking questions and participating. And then my teachers just being like, Sam should apply himself. And I'd be like, eh, I'm going to play more basketball. So when I got to college, I finally you know, got my butt kicked. And the first couple of years were really rough. First time I'd ever gotten grades. I was just like, oh my gosh, there's so much information. And I remember just really wanting to do well sophomore year. I had like taken on a lot. I was playing basketball in college and um, had joined like every club because I came from this tiny Quaker school. I was like, oh my gosh, there's all these things to do. So I was on an improv team, sang a cappella, played ultimate Frisbee, started a mentorship program, playing a varsity sport. Like too many things, but I was like, I really need to do well in school. I'm, I'm tired of doing poorly. So I like went to the the learning center and I remember the first time talking to my counselor and she was like, uh, she's trying to help me with natural history of invertebrates. This class, I had to learn like hundreds of species of beetle. And, um, she was like, Sam, what are you doing to study? I was like, I keep reading the textbook, reading the chapter over and over. It doesn't sink in. Like, I don't know what to do. She's like, have you tried flashcards? And I was like, flashcards. Oh my gosh. Like that's genius. I started using <laughs> flashcards. And what do you know? Like I was able to memorize all these beetles and I was like writing this paper and she was like, Sam, like you've got a 10 page paper due on Wednesday. Like what, what's your approach? And I was like, well, I need to find a topic. And she's like, okay, you need to do an outline. And I was like an outline. Like, that's a great idea. And I came back to her the next day. And I was like, I made an outline. It was like filling in the blanks. Like this is so easy. And so learning those skills was like really encouraging and I was all of a sudden realized that I might be capable of like absorbing information through academia. And then I studied abroad in Madagascar and started doing my research for my thesis. And it was during that time working with doctors that I thought maybe this is a career that could work for me. Like it's a lot of puzzles and problem solving and working with people and animals. Um, and so the thought was go into pediatric medicine and shout out a bunch of pediatricians totally dissuaded like the human medical system and particularly the people I shadowed just really didn't appreciate the way it had changed over the past like 15 years. So then over time, it just went more towards veterinary medicine. And I think, you know, kind of the final ticket, I was graduated from college and uh, had a massive debt of prerequisites to take care of because I figured that out so late and living in California, 
and find I found Pet Desk early on. So I was like first first hire there outside of the founders, pretty much. And so learning the veterinary industry really kind of like gave me an insight into how things worked a little bit differently than they might in practice or in school. So I stayed with that group for a long time and then uh, ended up going to NC State in 2020 when basically the company got to a size where we could hire smarter people to do the roles that I was doing before. So <laughs> that's kind of the the long-winded version of how I got to where I am now. And so I'm in my third year and just loving every minute of it. Yeah. Oh, wonderful. Okay. I can't let it go because Madagascar is always sounded so cool. So what was your, your research and what was it like in Madagascar? Uh, my research, I was looking into aspects of hibernation in this species of lemur. So the dwarf lemurs go into hibernation and having 96, 97% similarity in their genome to us, it's a really fascinating thing that a primate is able to go into hibernation for five to seven months. So during the active season, these little 400 gram uh, lemurs are, you know, bouncing around in the trees, nocturnal, like just frugivores and their heart rates like 260 beats per minute. And then during hibernation, it drops down to like four to six beats per minute. So, you know, really, really deep metabolic depression. But curiously, during that five to seven months, they're not just flatlined at that four to six beats per minute with very little brain activity and, you know, just little metabolism in general. They actually go through these spontaneous arousal periods where they'll bring their heart rate up to like 36 beats per minute, their brain activity will increase and they'll kind of like stay at that period for a couple hours and then they'll dip back down into true hibernation for another five to 12 days. So that happens throughout their total period of hibernation and we didn't know why at the time. So my research was looking at whether or not that could have to do with the buildup of secondary metabolites due to just not breathing, you know, they breathe like once every 11 minutes or something. So maybe they're building up lactic acid and they're arousing in order to exhaust that. So I was basically just taking a pinprick, tiny little micro droplet of blood and assessing the lactate levels during different periods of non-spontaneous arousal. And it was really amazing research and super fun to be in the mountains of Madagascar. I got to live there for like 13 months over the span of a year and a half. And living there was really challenging just because it's such an incredibly diverse place, not just in terms of its flora and fauna, but there's a lot of different cultures that exist in Madagascar and the people are extremely friendly. And it's kind of this, you know, historically, it was the second to last massive body of land that was colonized by humans. Then the last was New Zealand. So it's a really interesting place, but it's just sad in terms of, you know, the quality of life for a lot of people and access to goods. And a lot of resources are unfortunately being taken advantage of by other countries. So a lot of deforestation and pet trade and things like that. But since then, the research has has continued. We found out that lactate had nothing to do with their arousal. They just actually came out of hibernation to go to sleep and enter REM. So it's kind of cool. Yeah. Well, wow. It sounds like you learned a lot about not only science, but life and economy and all sorts of things on that trip. I've always advocated for going and exploring different cultures and traveling. So yeah, what a cool opportunity. Now back to Pet Desk. Do you mind sharing a little bit about what Pet Desk is and how maybe you got involved and some things that you're excited about with that? Absolutely. Um, So I got involved super just like out of the blue, happened to be living in San Diego. I was decompressing the 10th floor of my apartment building. I was living with my cousin has a hot tub on it. So after a long day at work, I was sitting in the hot tub, ended up chatting with this guy and he was talking to me about his interests. I was telling him about what I was hoping to do in veterinary medicine. And after like an hour of pruning in the hot tub, we were like, he was like, you know, Sam, you're such a weird kid. Like I want to introduce you to my friend Taylor. He's starting an app company. So literally I slipped my resume under this guy's door and he passed it on to his friend. And then that's how I got hired on at Pet Desk. And so Pet Desk automates marketing and client communications for veterinary hospitals. So integrates with, I don't know how many practice management systems at this point, and is basically taking over some of the responsibilities that most vet clinics just don't have time to like necessarily put 
a lot of effort into. So giving clients chances to book appointments online, there's a loyalty program, you build websites. And so the the key that Pet Desk kind of differentiates from other reminder systems is that there's an app. So we've got over 4 million app users now. And that app is something that stays on the client's phone, the, the pet owner's phone as a utility in between visits. So one, that's really great because the clinic now has a way to make sure that they're reaching their clients for all their reminders and they're coming back for their appointments. But two, we're building utility for pet parents to be able to you know, help manage the lives of their pets and keep them healthy for as long as possible. So the mission of the company is to extend pet lives by million years in the next 10 years. And like that would be a, an awesome, ambitious goal. And we want to have the data to prove it. So now that I'm in school, a lot of what I'm doing is just tacking on to specific projects. My title's Veterinary Alliances Director, but I don't do too much with that anymore. I'm pretty much just on individual projects that I think are beneficial. So we've got an equity scholarship with several schools that I think is really awesome. We've got an advisory council that I need to be more involved with. And then, you know, just some projects around how to, I guess, help pet parents understand and navigate the the wild world of veterinary medicine, kind of from the layman's perspective. So I'm really excited about that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and by the way, vet school is, is a full-time job too. So don't be too yeah. hard on yourself, but what a unique perspective. So one of the things that really it's hard to teach and learn about in vet school is working with clients and understanding client needs and, and communicating with them. And that's, you know, it sounds like that's one big thing that Pet Desk does. So what is something that you have learned through working with Pet Desk, just that you don't think maybe a lot of other veterinary students might know, especially about clients, but anything in general that you've learned from that? Well, I, th I think the biggest thing having kind of this dual perspective in school, like I've really appreciated the fact that a lot of my expertise isn't clinical coming into vet school. I, I actually haven't worked in that many vet offices and I, you know, I've done research in Madagascar, but again, that's kind of niche. The fact that I've had to kind of like coordinate the information that we're learning in school with the information I brought in with me from totally different parts of my brain has been really, really fun because I've had to make those connections kind of work in different routes and stuff like that. So in school, we get an education about communication, but it's it's not integrated in the way that it it could be in terms of a systemic approach. Like we need to be actually making that a part of every single course, not just like, here's a two week course on, you know, business and communication. Um, because genuinely, when you talk to practices, the ones that have figured out like, you know, what, what kind of clients are we serving? How do we best serve the client base that might be our ideal customer profile? Or like, what is the the mission that we have as an individual business that I can like point to every single employee and say, like, all of us understand that this is what we are trying to, you know, have our clients walk away from with an experience at our hospital. The ones that have that are the hospitals that are, you know, successful, that have less team turnover and um, the ones that don't, it seems like there's more like of that putting out fires attitude, unfortunately. And so I think, you know, we are given opportunities at, at school to take part in role plays with clients and, you know, to take a history and stuff early on so that we can start to familiarize ourselves with that process. And to me, I think there's just a lack of like understanding that like that experience isn't how well you can take a history. It's actually, can you effectively communicate and make this person feel comfortable? Can you build rapport and build trust so that you can actually, you know, end the exam or end that appointment with a recommendation that they're going to adhere to because they trust you and because you've built that relationship with them. So it's interesting because I, I think the greatest lessons I learned at Pet Desk didn't have anything to do with automating communication. It had everything to do with working with people. And so when I was managing our customer facing teams, I actually implemented 45 minutes every Friday of improvisational training. So we would take it like applied improv techniques and we had like a curriculum and we would build those skills because in a lot of ways, that type of activity is strengthening the muscles of like negotiating difficult conversations and like adapting to the unknown and like letting yourself be vulnerable. And those are, you know, keys along with curiosity, as we've talked about before, to building successful relationships and being an effective communicator. 
Uh, I think you're completely spot on. And I, I love the idea of kind of taking all of the skills like you would and, you know, on the job and integrating that into every aspect of the curriculum. So yeah, that's amazing. And and you said you you came in with different experiences and, and not as much clinical. And you mentioned you have quite a few family members who are in veterinary medicine. I didn't ask. So what what do they do? What kind of veterinary medicine are they involved with? I feel like I should should always give a caveat whenever I talk about my experiences in Madagascar and say, like, just know that I, I have no autonomy and I'm not original because <laughs> my dad worked at the Duke Lemur Center for 20 years oh. and <laughs> had better name of the Duke Lemur Center. So I, I always feel like I need to justify like my own experiences by saying when he started, I was like 15 and I went with him on one of his first expeditions over to Madagascar as a research assistant. So that's where I kind of caught the bug for Madagascar and um, then ended up applying to study abroad there and petitioning the school to let me go. But uh, yeah, so my dad is a wildlife uh, veterinarian by training. And then he got his PhD in epidemiology from UNC and then was, yeah, head veterinarian at the Lemur Center up until I guess it was just a year and a half ago he retired. And then my aunt worked at several practices in the Triangle area and did relief and she just retired this last year too so oh. unfortunately there's no opportunity for nepotency at the lemur center i'm gonna have to <laughs> my way there on my own <laughs> no but that also makes sense too because one of the things that we seem to have in common is the desire to let people know that there are so many different ways that veterinary can look like and like all these different types of career paths and 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 you can pick one and then maybe change. Like there's so many different opportunities. So just continuing on that, like what makes you so passionate about the need to let people know about the diversity of options in vet and med? Well, starting with my own personal, just kind of like reasons for being excited about veterinary medicine. I was, as I mentioned, thinking about pediatrics and then thinking about veterinary medicine. And one of the reasons why human medicine wasn't as exciting for me is because there was a lot more legislation and there was a lot more bureaucracy and the business of medicine had already taken a much stronger foothold in the industry. And so looking at veterinary medicine, it's like we're in the crux of this incredible inflection point where corporatization and technology and telemedicine as a piece of that are kind of on this like exponential rise within the industry and and that inflection is an opportunity for us to decide how are we going to implement these tools how are we going to implement these structures and what is that going to look like for a pets but then b like the people that are providing care and so traditionally we've had this industry that's steeped in kind of a you know like there's some cynicism about like the opportunity to make money in veterinary medicine or the work life balance or you know, working at a vet clinic is like really traditionally hard and vet clinics are behind on technology and all these things. But like, we're at this point now where pet parents are people that we call pet parents, you know, like 15 years ago, that wasn't the case. And so people are spending a lot of money and there's all this opportunity that comes with that. And so that to me is like, I feel like we need to push right now so that if me and all of my classmates can graduate and be like super confident that we can unite our voice to say this is how we should be doing things and this is you know the way that we want to implement these tools then we can make a difference and we can shape the way that that our industry ends up providing healthcare versus maybe how the human healthcare system currently looks so that's that was kind of the big picture and then i think yeah i just got you know even more entrenched in it as i discovered all of the tragic you know aspects of how long veterinarians are practicing after spending so long trying to get to the profession that they ended up at, you know, the the burnout rates are so high and depression is such a huge issue. And so figuring out how we can try to change that in a way that makes people feel more positive about the work they're doing. And I think a big piece of that is recognizing that the degree is incredibly flexible and that you can do all of these different things. And as long as like the effect of what you're doing is helping animals, then like that's practicing veterinary medicine and that's you know, utilizing your degree. And I think, you know, it's just easy to fall into like, well, if you're not hands-on patients every day, 
cutting and sewing, then, <laughs> you know, then that's not being a real vet. But but the reality is, especially as we have the chat GPTs and, you know, other tools come into our profession, like we're going to be utilizing these different threads of information and diagnostics and just distributing that to maybe laymen or other professionals. And that's going to be more and more a part of our job. And so I think understanding that we can be more flexible with our degree than practicing hands-on medicine every day is is one step. And so I've just tried to figure out ways that I could try to, you know, build build community in a sense that we have this like lasting, I guess, just network of individuals where we can lean on each other and try to figure out how to put the right people in positions to lead um, this next phase of of our awesome profession. Yeah. And you've done so much with that too, because you were telling me that you've been bringing other vet students into different conferences. So what are their reactions? How how are they feeling about that? I mean, so the, the most recent experience was Fetch in Charlotte, which was last weekend. In in my mind, I had all of this five and a half years of like working in the industry and being a part of groups like Vet Partners, where I got to meet a lot of people that have the same passion for helping vet students and changing the profession that I do. So having built up this network of like people that are like eager to try to figure out how we can make positive change. Once I was in school, you know, I was kind of like talking to folks about my experience and trying to figure out like, okay, how can we make this happen? And so there were a lot of really generous people that financially just said like, let's bring students to the vet conference. So I rented a 15 passenger van and 20 of us plus a car, 20 vet students came to fetch. And, you know, I kind of like a little bit bribed them. I was like, look, you get free admission, free transportation, free stay, but you've got to participate in these nerdy games that I have planned for you. So like I basically had this, this game where I said, you've got to reach out to this list of vendors prior to the conference, pick three that like excite you that you're like, whoa, I didn't realize that it existed in vet med and reach out to them and say like, hey, is there somebody that I can meet at the conference at the exhibit hall and talk to you about what you're doing? I think it's really interesting. And then once they went to the conference, they had the, you know, during process, which was meet with those people and ask them, like, who are three people either in this room at this conference or in the industry that get you really excited about where vet med is going? And then reach out to those people and either meet with them or just shoot them an email. And so the concept was like, we can build an effective network of people that show us like aspects of the profession that we may not have even known existed a week prior that are going to be support systems for the rest of our time in school and really going to be a big part of our foundation of our, you know, connections moving forward into the profession. So I'm having debriefs with the students that came to the conference now and the feedback has been really great. Like one student said that, you know, their first year, they said that this was the most eye-opening experience they had thus far in their first year at vet school. And so, you know, that's really encouraging. I think there's an opportunity for us to, you know, continue to get different groups to support students coming to conferences. I think VMX would be an awesome step for us to try to see like, hey, how many students can we get to VMX to have that experience? Hi, I wanted to take a moment and thank you for listening to the Vet Life Reimagined podcast. If you're enjoying the show, the best way to support us is to leave a rating and review on your favorite podcast app. It really helps us to reach more listeners and we really appreciate it. Thanks for listening. And now back to the episode. Any other feedback that you've heard so far from the students and maybe something that they found interesting or especially I love First of all, you're so wise. This is su- such a cool idea. Um, <laughs> but especially because you specifically emphasized finding something that excites you about the profession. So what are you hearing there? What's exciting in the that's kind of coming or happening in the profession that you're hearing? Well, I'm not sure about specifically, but I do know that I, I did something similar at BMX, where I encouraged several uh, classmates of mine to get down to the conference. And basically, they, you know, now one of them is like super interested in how AI has influenced radiology. So they've changed kind of their 
whole like focus in school. They've started like working with different groups. They did an externship that was like business uh, related externship over the summer, got introduced to all of these entrepreneurial veterinarians. And now when they show up at NCVC, you know, they like know half the people in the room and, you know, they're like super excited about even helping put on a conference that's centered around the use of AI and these different imaging modalities. And so it's it's just incredible to see like that's just one case example of like, you know, obviously you put vet students in vet school and they're going to kick butt. If you put vet students in a vet conference, they're going to kick butt. And so it's it's just awesome to see how, you know, that genius is just playing out in terms of like making those connections and doing their research and, you know, coming up with novel ideas. And it's like super encouraging to see that. So I think that's probably the the most filled out example since that started last year rather than a week ago. But yeah, I'm really excited to learn more and, you know, try to make facilitate whatever connections that I can personally. I know that we'll be trying to do the same thing again next year. Yeah. Well, and I, I hope we can spread this word and people will reach out and offer to help sponsor and, and maybe have different events and activities as well for other vet students. Um, so we haven't yet a- a talked about what are you thinking about doing your third year? Your, it's coming up. Do you have any ideas of what you would like to do after vet school? Well, I do have ideas, but clinical rotation starting in a little over a month. I really want to make sure that I don't bring any of my perceived intelligence or bias into the next you know, 24 rotations of like basically novel experiences to me. Um, the fact that I haven't had a ton of clinical experience, I want to make sure that like, if I fall in love with eyeballs, then like, cool, like maybe I'll go into ophthalmology. But if I, if I were being realistic, I think that I probably won't end up specializing. I love the idea of being a generalist and being able to communicate with pet parents on a like longer timeline and being able to work with families. I'd love to be able to work with children in some capacity. But right now I'm thinking a like small animal rotating internship would be a great way for me to condense a lot of experience into one year and um, just make sure that I see a a high caseload and feel comfortable in practice because I I feel that inevitably I'm going to split my time between practicing medicine and also like advocating and participating in the industry to try to, you know, encourage more people to, to fill that void and yeah, just continue these conversations. I know I can turn around and shout really loudly at pet desk and be like, Hey, do things the right way. But I think there's an opportunity for us to like do something more. Yeah, absolutely. So I'm also really curious. You, you started saying, I'm going to, I don't want to do what my parents have done. I I, I want to not do vet med. And then here you are in vet school. Did your dad have any thoughts about <laughs> the, the change of heart? <laughs> Oh, he was stoked. Of course, yeah, he, was, he was super excited. And I, and I honestly, I'd be flattered if I could be like my parents. I adore them, and I think it's just it's funny that I ended up, you know, following in their in their footsteps. But but no, I I really appreciate where I am and and what they've done. So uh, I would love to be able to work with my dad one day. You know, I I'm not sure that he he'll practice medicine, but if we can figure out something to do together, that would be awesome. And back to what we we're talking about, there's so many different ways to impact. The profession, whether it's fellow colleague, encouraging students, and that's not being in a clinic, you know, with, with a stethoscope, but it's so important that those roles are to continue growing this profession to be better and better, bringing in the, the technology and all the different things. You know, I, I loved your attitude about working with your classmates to really use your voice and your actions to create the veterinary medicine that you want to see in in the future. I'm excited about it as well. It's people like yourself that just continue to get me excited about this profession. So thank you for everything that you do. Uh, I'm very, very excited. I hope we stay in touch and I get to see all the work that you're doing. Um, But before I let you go, any anything else that I, I should have asked or that you would like to to share with the profession? No, I don't think so. I feel like we covered a lot of things that I normally don't get to talk about, uh, which is is fun. Um, yeah, I think mainly I just genuinely want to connect with people that are 
like-minded and and want to do the same things. And I really believe in in this profession and I'm looking forward to talking more with folks and like I'm on the the planning committee for the Veterinary Innovation Summit next year. So I think, you know, that's an awesome conference that historically has really probed a lot of these questions. And I think it should be a good chance for some great discussion. So people should look forward to that. But yeah, outside of that, just come to Raleigh and hit me up. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds great. Okay, so your final four questions. The first one is, what is something people may get wrong about you? I don't know. I feel like, I guess I can come across as maybe being like pretty loud and big. I'm like almost 6'3 and just, I try not to take up a, a lot of space, but you know, I, I really love like hearing people's stories. I didn't ask you a lot of questions, so maybe I'm like totally being a hypocrite, but I love hearing people's stories and listening to, you know, what people have to say. And um, so I I just want to try to be approachable to everybody. And so I hope that my energy doesn't come across as, as like too much, but yeah. You take up that space. You're, you're fine. (laughs) That's good. Uh, The second question is what is a hidden skill or interest that you have? Okay. Well, we talked about this a little bit, so spoiled for you, but a skill that I've been working on a lot is just like, trying to engage my curiosity, particularly in times when it's not readily available. I think a lot of times it's easy for me to be curious if I'm like bored or something and I have to like find something to do with my time or with my brain, but it's the times when I'm frustrated or angry or annoyed or just, you know, like feeling off that I've been trying to engage my curiosity more and more. And so the skill that I've been working on is really cheesy, but literally I found out that across all cultures, languages, and rearings, humans verbalize curiosity the same way. And so like all of us can recognize curiosity in one another. Whenever we hear, we know that that person's being curious, regardless of what language they speak. And when I heard that, I was like, that's incredible. So then it turns out that when you verbalize curiosity like that, it actually like changes which aspects of your brain you're using and, you know, lights up different parts of your brain. And so it literally makes you more open. And so I've just tried to practice that skill of like being like hmm, in situations when I might not normally feel curious. And it's a pretty fun thing to do, but um, it's honestly, it's been one of the favorite life hacks that I figured out in the last couple of years. I have never heard that life hack before. So I, I think I, I naturally kind of do that, but now I'm going to be more intentional and and do it more. So I love that. Yeah. <laughs> Question number three is, is there anything on your bucket list that you would love to to do? The number one for a long time is to swim with whale sharks. I don't know why, but I just would love to be next to one of those massive creatures. They just seem amazing. Have you been to the Atlanta Aquarium? I actually, yeah, I just got my German citizenship. And so I had to go down to the consulate and got to visit the uh, aquarium while I was there. It doesn't count. I want to, I want to be in the water. Right, right. But there is an opportunity. Maybe. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that was incredible. <laughs> Very cool. And finally, what is something you're most grateful for? I'm right now I'm feeling really grateful for my dog, Abigail. She's snoring behind me. She's turning 11 tomorrow. I know our dogs have the same birthday, but I think in in a more serious way, I'm just very, very grateful for our, all of my you know, community here in Raleigh and the community that I have out in Fort Collins and the people that have helped me, you know, be the person that I am. I, I'm in this kind of liminal space of being in school and juggling a profession. And that can be a little bit intimidating because maybe I like lost what I had when I was working and maybe I spent too much time working in school and I won't be a great veteran. You know, there's all these voices chattering, but I feel really grounded in the relationships that I have with all the people in our profession and just in general. So super grateful for that. I also live with my brother and his wife, which is an amazing opportunity that I know I'll treasure forever. This has been the Vet Life Reimagined podcast. Whether you are listening or watching on YouTube, I hope you enjoyed this conversation. Please make sure you are subscribed to catch all these amazing people in our profession. Also send this episode to someone you think who would appreciate it. Have a recommendation for someone who would be a good guest? Please reach out on LinkedIn, Instagram, or Facebook. There aren't that many Dr. Sprinkles. Until next time, vet lifers.